It is a privilege <clears throat> to be here with you at this worship service this morning. I thank your pastor in charge, the Reverend Yam Kai Hui, and your leaders for this invitation to come and share with you on this occasion of the observance of Trinity Theological College Sunday. I bring you very warm greetings from the principal, the Reverend Dr. Edwin Tay, the staff, as well as the faculty of Trinity Theological College. TTC recently celebrated our 72nd anniversary, and despite the current coronavirus pandemic, we recount God's goodness to the college such that we may indeed continue to be light of the world. We also like to thank your pastors, your leaders, and the congregation of St. Kang Methodist Church for always sending to us your very best in terms of your finances, your prayers, and your people to be trained as co-workers in the Methodist Church in Singapore. <clears throat> it has been a joy for me to have Jason in my classes, and I hope that the church will continue to support his plans to go to the mission field in time to come. I also bring you greetings from Caris Methodist Church, as well as from the Chinese Annual Conference. I think uh, most of you know that I teach uh, missions, in fact, all the mission courses at TTC, and, in, and among the who's who in missions, I wonder if you have heard of the name Charles Thomas Studd. Charles Thomas Studd. C.T. Studd, as he's known, was born in 1860 and into a wealthy as well as an affluent family. He was converted during his college years at Cambridge and began to follow Jesus in faithful obedience. In his own day, he was one of the best cricketer, as Michael Jordan is to basketball or Lionel Messi is to football, C.T. Studd was to cricket. The public had expected him to play professionally and thereafter return to London to embrace a life of affluence as well as influence. But Studd chose to forsake all of that for the sake of participation in God's global purposes. <clears throat> At a revival meeting, C.T. Studd gave his life to Jesus. That encounter with Jesus and his call to take up your cross and follow after me rang clear and loud, and very soon, C.T. Studd left England to join Hudson Taylor in his mission work in China. He was one that was known as, he was one of the Cambridge Seven. And he had a radical change of life's purposes and ambition, even as he entered into the fields in China. Instead of success as defined by power, privilege, and possessions, C.T. Studd redefined his life's priorities. He wrote, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Right? Some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. While serving in China, <clears throat> he reached the age of 25 and became the recipient of his father's inheritance and that was a huge inheritance of 29,000 pounds. And this was in the late 19th century. Where then he happily gave tens of thousands away to various charities and mission organizations. He kept only 3,500 pounds. In China, <clears throat> he met a young Irish missionary named Priscilla Livingstone Stewart. And just before the wedding, he presented his bride with the remaining money from his inheritance. Somewhat with similar deep convictions on the mission field, his wife-to-be, Priscilla, said to him, Charlie, what did the Lord tell the rich young man to do? Sell all, that's what he said. Well then, we will start clear with the Lord at our wedding. And then they proceeded to give the rest of that 3,500 pounds away for the Lord's work. 
Together, they served in China for about 10 years before ill health took them to return, uh, took them, forced them to return to England. And after he had been nursed back to health, C.T. Studd joined the student volunteers movement in the United States to reach out to college youth. Between 1900 and 1906, C.T. Studd left then to pastor a church in India, responding to the burden that the Lord had placed upon him. And when he returned to England in 1906, it was through a time of rest that he heard God's call for him to begin a mission work in Central Africa. Though penniless and not in the best of health, C.T. Studd responded again and left for Sudan alone. It was in Africa where he founded the Heart for Africa mission in 1913, which was later renamed as the Worldwide Evangelization for Christ, what we know today as WEC, W-E-C. And this foundation was based on the same principles as Hudson Taylor's China Inland Mission. Stutt then continued the work that he was called until he was called home in 1930 at the age of 70. In a letter home, he gave a last backward look at the events of his life. And this is what he wrote, I quote, As I believe I am now nearing my departure from this world, I have but a few things to rejoice. They are these. Firstly, that God called me to China, and I went in spite of utmost opposition from my loved ones. Secondly, that I joyfully acted as Christ told that rich young man to act. Thirdly, that I deliberately, at the call of God, went alone on the Bobby Liner in 1910, gave up my life for this work, which was to be henceforth not for Sudan only, but for the whole unevangelized world. My only joys, therefore, are that when God has given me a work to do, I have not refused it. My only joys, therefore, are that when God had given me a work to do, I had not refused it. Church, my question for us is, if you had only one week more to live, how would you spend this last week? C.T. Studd did not wait for that final week in his life before thinking about what he should do. In fact, his life is perhaps most beautifully summed up in his very own words. The poem that he wrote, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Will you join me as we come to God in prayer? Let us pray. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. I have chosen a very familiar passage of Psalm 90 as the text for us to focus for on in our meditation this morning. Some of you will realize that Psalm 90 is often read at funerals. The reason is because at every funeral we are forced to come face to face with the brevity of life and the reality of death. Every funeral provides us the occasion to understand the significance between God's time as well as our time. But ours is a culture that, light, that fights the natural passage of time. And one example is that we are a culture that is more comfortable with anti-wrinkle creams, hair dyes, and Botox shots. And oftentimes it is only at a funeral that we are confronted with the brevity as well as the fragility of life itself. It's an incidentally, this is also the second last Sunday of the liturgical year, as, and as if we are faced with the close or the death of another year, Psalm 90 is fitting for us 
to look at and to think about our earthly life and the meaning thereof. Not only is the message of Psalm 90 important, the location of the psalm also lends gravitas to the message. What do I mean by location? Well, Psalm 90, if you know where it is, it is, the first, it is actually the first psalm of Book 4 in the collection of psalms. The Psalter, that is the collection of 150 psalms, is divided into five books. Book 1, from Psalm 1 to Psalm 41. Book 2, from Psalm 42 to 72. Book 3, from Psalm 73 to 89. And book 4, from Psalm 90 to 106. With the last book, from a reading from Psalms 107 to 150. And so Psalm 90 is located as the opening psalm in book 4 of the Psalter. In the tradition of uh, Israel, they would gather under the leadership of the priests and offer to God as a community each time they are faced with crisis. And they cry then loudly to God for his intervention. And Psalm 90 is one such lament. It is a lament from a gathered community. It is a cry of the community for God to intervene and for him to bring deliverance. But besides this crisis setting, Psalm 90 is also interesting in that it is the opening psalm of Book 4 of the, of the Psalter. Book 3 of the Psalter, if you read the psalm ahead of psalm, before Psalm 90, you'll realize that it is a collection of prayers lamenting on the judgment that had befallen all of Jerusalem. This was a collection of prayers of the people that had been brought into exile, where God is seemingly silent. And this context becomes very important when we read the superscription of Psalm 90, which attributes this psalm to Moses. This was a psalm, a lament that Moses made to the Lord. Recall that Moses led the people through the Red Sea, and through the wilderness. But Moses himself did not enter the promised land. In just the superscription itself, the readers are transported back to the time before Israel had a king, back to a time before Israel had a temple, back to a time even before Israel had the land. Yet before all this, God was there, and God heard the cry, of Moses. In the face of physical changes, the psalm reminds us that it is still possible to relate to God in prayer, to talk to God in lament, because while time changes, when events change, God is the one who remains changeless. God is the one who remains constant. Amidst a context where Israel is thrown into exile, where all of Israel undergoes upheavals and change, Psalm 90 opens Book 4 of the Psalter with the bold affirmation that God, you have been my dwelling place. And similarly, in our current context, amidst the coronavirus pandemic, where our lives, our work, our leisure and also our worship has been thrown into somewhat of a chaos amidst what I would call a new abnormal. We are con comforted by the fact that amidst all of these changes in our lives, God remains constant. He is our dwelling place. I do not presume that we have time to go through the psalm line by line, but allow me here to provide a summary outline of this psalm. The psalm indeed may be divided into two parts, from verses 1 to 12 and from verses 13 to 17. The first part of Psalm 90 presents a sequence of three observations that leads into lament and subsequent petitions from verses 13 to 17. So in the first part, we have three observations. 
The three observations are firstly, observation one, that God is eternal. God is eternal. Even before Israel had a temple, even before Israel had the land, even before Israel had a king, God was there when Moses prayed. The point that the psalmist makes is that God is eternal and his reign precedes even time itself. I like how Eugene Peterson translates the verse to everlasting, from everlasting to everlasting, he translates it to read, long before you brought earth itself into birth, from once upon a time to kingdom come, you are God. From once upon a time to kingdom come, you are God. And so the point is that God is eternal. God is changeless. God was there before the very foundations of earth itself. Observation two, in contrast, human lives are temporal. It is fleeting. Where God is eternal, humanity is ephemeral. We are but dust and will return to dust. The psalmist reminds us of the brevity of human life. We are like grass, perhaps even like the morning glory that fades from the passing of each day. And this is reminiscent of the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes in his acclamation that vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In the Hebrew, the word is better translated, the word vanity is better translated as breath or smoke or vapor, such that Ecclesiastes 1-2 should be read as smoke, nothing but smoke. There's nothing to anything. It is all smoke. And then observation three, the psalmist reflects on the human lifespan and observes the futility of all of human life because of sin. The futility of human life because of sin. So perhaps a three-word summary of this first section of Psalm 90 is eternal, ephemeral, and futile. Right? Eternal, ephemeral, and futile. That God is eternal, humanity is ephemeral, and our lives are lived in futility because of sin. From these three observations, the psalmist then laments and makes a plea to God. Just as Moses beseeched the Lord to turn from his judgments on disobedient Israel, the psalmist makes three petitions to the Lord. As in verse 13, he says, Turn or return, Lord. It is his way of pleading with God to turn and to hear his petitions. The first is a plea to God begging for divine wisdom that we may live today in the light of eternity, divine wisdom. The second is a plea for divine mercy, that God might redeem the days on, our days on earth so that we may know joy. It is a prayer that God be merciful to us that we might indeed know what joy is. Bear in mind that there is a marked difference between being joyful and being happy. We must never confuse joy with happiness. Having a smile on your face does not necessarily mean that you are joyful. And then the third plea that Moses makes to God is for divine blessing. It is a prayer, a plea for divine blessing upon the work of our hands. The Hebrew word prosper really means to establish. When Moses asked for God to establish the work of our hands, that is translated in some English translation as prosper. But I think most of the other versions translate it rightly to say establish. To establish in Hebrew refers to a divine action that God and God alone can do. To establish refers Permanence. It denotes permanence. In the face of all that is temporal, it is a plea for God to make permanent the work of our hands, because only that which God establishes will last for all eternity. 
We can then perhaps summarize Psalm 90 with three descriptions and three petitions. A few weeks ago, a Pastor Ned messaged me and asked me about the sermon text and the sermon title. I wanted to choose a Chinese proverb as the title for today's sharing. Guo uh, Yan Yun Yuan. I think most of you will know what that proverb means. It is smoke that passes through the eyes. Uh, but I decided against that, and probably I thought that evanescence would actually reflect that same concept of being like smoke, being temporal, which means the quality of being fleeting or vanishing quickly, or the idea of impermanence, evanescence. In our current coronavirus pandemic, it is easy to think that our lives are indeed fleeting, and most of what we do amounts to almost nothing or nothing. Right? Things are fleeting. It's like maybe if you think about where we are and where we were, uh, it was in the blink of an eye that uh, we went through a circuit breaker, and right now we are almost at the end of 2020, and we ask ourselves, what happened? Evanescence. Everything is fleeting. And this is the reality of life itself. If we read only the first part of Psalm 90, that is really reality as we see it. But Psalm 90 presents for us the description of life as well as the prescription to life. Let me say that again. Psalm 90 presents for us the description of life as well as the prescription to life by way of three observances and in the form of three petitions. The message resonates with that of the book of Ecclesiastes that under the sun that is apart from God, all of life is meaningless. All of life is evanescence. The psalmist's petitions are appeals to God to give meaning to life, to transform fragility to faithfulness and to convert evanescence into that which is enduring. Giving meaning, giving permanence, is what God is able to do for those who entrust their lives to him. Growing up, the story is that Jimmy had always wanted to be a policeman. From a young age, he looked up to the police officers and it could be because his dad himself had died while he was nine years old and he wanted to feel secure as he previously did, held by his dad's big hugs. He thought that being a policeman would in turn help others feel secure in a world fraught with danger. He had believed that being a policeman was one of the most noble professions and a good policeman was important to him. So Jimmy studied hard and went to college where he excelled and then went on to graduate school, all with the single purpose to be the best police officer he can be. And Jimmy became one of the happiest men in New York when he got his badge and started working for the Port Authority Police Department. He rose through the ranks, impressing everyone with the fact that police work was never his job, but instead his passion. In 1993, when a terrorist, a terrorist truck bomb hit the World Trade Center, he rushed into the thick blanket of smoke to rescue the people that were caught there. Most people did not know that Jimmy suffered from a severe asthma. Reflecting on his actions, he told his brother later on, you have to do what you have to do. There were people inside. Jimmy probably thought that that is what my dad would have done for me and that is what I would have done for my two little girls. And back at the police academy, those that he had taught would report that he often said this, you have to give your life for something that makes a difference. You have to give your life for something that makes a difference. 
on September 11, 2001. Jimmy was on his way to teach classes in Jersey City when news of the terrorist attack broke. He rushed across the Hudson River and without regard for his own asthmatic condition or for his life, he rushed into one of those twin towers. He was seen on the 27th floor coughing in an asthmatic attack. Other rescuers told him that he had to get out while there was still time. But Jimmy stayed his post, directing people down the stairs of a building minutes before both the towers fell. The next day, amidst the rubble, his grief-stricken wife said of his heroic death. The wife said, he told me, when I go out of this world, I want to know that I made a difference. When I go out of this world, I want to know that I made a difference. The life of Officer James Nelson, Jimmy, challenges us to ask the same question, what am I doing to make a difference? We do not know when there will be no more opportunities. We do not know whether our final act will be one of heroism or altruism. We only know that our time is limited. And as Jimmy's wife said of him, he made the best of the life he lived. Church, how are we making a difference today? It has been said, three things, once they're gone, never comes back. Words, opportunities, and time. Three things, once they're gone, never come back. Words, opportunity, and time. In this regard, the words of the psalmist hold true. The prayer is to teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Verse 12. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. And I leave us with the words of the missionary C.T. Studd, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Will you join me as we pray? I close with the words of Isaac Watts. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our God while trouble lasts and our eternal home. Almighty God, our eternal refuge, teach us to live with the knowledge of our death and to rejoice in the promise of your glory revealed to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.